Many years ago, Martin Luther King wrote a letter from a Birmingham jail. If you've never read that, you really owe it to yourself to read it. It is one of the great pieces of literature that comes out of the civil rights movement. I read it many years ago. I reread it again last week. More recently, there's a book that has been published, a small booklet by Moody Publishers, entitled Letters to a Birmingham Jail. The idea is that many different authors wrote chapters indicating what they would say as to where the whole challenge of reconciliation is and race relations today. Brian Loritz is the editor, and in it he tells a very interesting story. He said that he was on a subway in New York with a friend, and whenever they came to a stop, the friend closed his eyes. And then when the train began to move again, he opened his eyes. And so Brian saw this a number of times and says, what's all that about? And he said, you must understand, my mother taught me that if I'm sitting down and a woman steps onto the train car and uh, she has no place to sit that the chivalrous thing for me to do is to get up and give her my seat but I don't want to get up my seat uh, today because I'm very comfortable here and so I just shut my eyes we've all done that haven't we haven't we all just shut our eyes and hope that eyes and hope that the issue would go away or that We would not have to be involved or somehow it does not exist. This message today is a very modest attempt for us to be challenged to open our eyes. Martin Luther King in his letter says how disappointed he was in the white church during the civil rights movement. He said that he would walk along a street and see these beautiful spires that pointed to heaven and ask himself the question, who really worships there? Who is there anywhere? And where are they in the face of such obvious injustice? And then he went on to say this about the church. So often the contemporary church is a weak and effectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often the church, and I'm sure he's referring here to the white church, is the arch defender of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structures of the average community are consoled by the church's silent and often vocal commitment to things as they are. Where was the church during those days? When King was accused of extremism, he said, was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. If you don't know about this, what you need to do is to listen to the stories of some of our brothers and sisters. And I would simply say to our white brothers and sisters that most of us have no idea of this underbelly and this undercurrent that exists in the African-American communities regarding the police. And uh, also, let's keep in mind that the demonstrations themselves oftentimes, which of course are totally legal, but the riots are not so much done by the local people as others who come into the situation and who make matters far worse. But all of this reveals the darker reality, and I'm quoting now an African American, all of this reveals the darker reality of what the African Americans deal with every day. And if it is not addressed, there will be more riots in the future. We must keep that context in mind. There is a simmering anger toward the police. Secondly, uh, there are those who say, well, comparatively, a lot of energy and a lot of media and a lot of time is spent against the police, but what about black on black crime? If black lives matter, and surely they do, then what is being done regarding the teenagers in Chicago and other cities that are almost weekly being killed as a result of black on black violence? An African American by the name of Vadi Bakum 
agrees and says, if a few black men killed by cops require a national dialogue, what do the overwhelming number of black on black murders require? Couple of comments though. Statistics would indicate that where you have a poor white community that lacks jobs, that is uh, marginalized, does not have good schools, you'll discover that white-on-white -white crime is almost percentage-wise just as it is even in the African-American community. Now sometimes you can use statistics one way or another, but the fact is that oftentimes this kind of violence is because of the sense of hopelessness, the sense of marginalization, the feeling that there not only is no hope for us, but we ourselves are hopeless people and as a result of buying into that kind of a mentality, what you have is the outgrowth of the violence that we see sometimes in all of our communities, but particularly in those that are under-resourced, those that are neglected, and so forth. Let me also say that the issue of black-on-black -black crime is constantly being addressed. There not only are various marches and various speeches, but programs for the young people, opportunities oftentimes are given so that they can work, so that alternatives are being given. Another uh, viewpoint is this, that uh, Poverty is blamed and poor schools and all that is serious, but the real cause is fatherlessness. And um, the answer to that is simply, yes, that is true. But I want us to be able to understand for a moment what it is like to live in the community where there are no schools that will really prepare you for the real world, and not only that, no jobs are available and where there seems to be a strike against you right from the beginning because you are of the wrong skin color. I want us to understand that point. And many of us struggle to understand it, but we must understand it. Now, of course, I could also mention that politically there's a different point of view conservative social agenda regarding or a, a more uh, liberal social agenda. All of these things play into the divide that we seem to see in America. But here's a question for you, my friend. Does the New Testament present a vision of reconciliation that is so powerful and so strong that we don't have to agree on all of these issues. There may be truth in all of them, and many people pick and choose between the issues. Is it necessary to resolve all those issues before we are fully and totally reconciled in Jesus, genuinely reconciled? And the answer is no, we can still have our differences and find Jesus to be more powerful than politics and the issues that divide us. Now, in order for us to see this, I want you to turn in your Bibles. I have preached on this passage before, but this week as I read it and meditated on it, I said, God, help me to see this passage with brand new eyes. And I believe that he answered that prayer. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two. Let's take a deep breath and find out what's going on here in the text. The Apostle Paul is talking about the Gentiles as being afar off. They did not receive the covenants of God. They were not the ones who were blessed as the Jews were. And as a result of this, the Jews became very racist against the Gentiles. They called them the uncircumcision, and that meant that, you know, you're rejected by God, you're not part of the covenant. 
Worse than that, they called them dogs. They called them dogs. It's impossible for us to recreate the kind of hostility that existed between the two groups. Certainly, probably worse than the hostility that exists today in America between the races. But notice what the Apostle Paul says. Let's go through this more carefully. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. Many people think it may even be the dividing wall in the temple that kept the Gentiles from the kind of closer worship that the Jews had, though the Jews themselves could not go into the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could do that. But nonetheless, the hostility was broken down. And more than that, it says, uh, making peace so that he might reconcile us both to God in one body, thereby, I'm in verse 16 now, killing the hostility. What Paul says is this, did you notice, from the two, he makes one new man. Of two, he makes one man. Boy, this struck me this week. What Paul is saying is that when God reconciles people, notice carefully, the Gentiles do not have to become Jews. The Jews do not have to become Gentiles. But God says that through the Holy Spirit, I create one person, one new man, and then he illustrates that in a number of different ways, as we shall see in a moment. What God seems to be saying with clarity to me is this, that in this body which God creates and which is described in the next verses, obviously blacks do not have to become whites, whites do not have to become blacks, Asians do not have to become Latinos, and Latinos do not have to become Asians, and on and on we could go in terms of diversity. What we're saying is a Gentile doesn't stop being a Gentile, a Jew doesn't stop being a Jew, but in Jesus, one new person has been created that transcends all of those differences. And that's the transformation that God wants to bring about. Now, in the Bible, and this becomes very important, what we must do is to keep before us God's vision of what it's going to be like in heaven. God says this in the book of Revelation, and in a moment we're going to be seeing exactly what God has to say. John says, I saw into heaven, and he says, I saw all these different diverse people, and the reason that he noticed their diversity is because they still have the same characteristics, ethnically and racially. And that is God's vision for a multi-ethnic, multi-racial bride. I've asked that these two verses be put on the screen so that we can read them together with all of our diversity and rejoice in the fact that we are going to have different people with us in glory. Let's read the verses together now. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Let's celebrate together, shall we? But we also participate in fellowship with Christ right now, and we remember him until he comes. We anticipate the future when someday we will sit down with him and there will be people from every tongue and every nation and every tribe 
and every color, and together we will worship and we anticipate that day of unity, of joy, and celebration. I hoped that this message today would end with celebrating all that God is doing and us being involved in His ministry, no matter where He leads us and calls us, because we are interested, first of all, in God's only agenda, which is reconciliation. That's why Paul says, examine your heart. Could we today examine our hearts specifically about the sin of racism, the feeling of superiority, the feeling of hostility? Can we confess that and then rejoice with all of our brothers and sisters in the unity of Jesus and the anticipation of even greater unity in heaven. Father, we pray that you might make us an honest people. May we be willing to look down deep into our hearts and say, Father, whatever is there that is displeasing, help us to have the attitude of Jesus who came to us as sinners not so much to judge us, but to save us, to redeem us, and to teach us that in your sight we are all equal, all in need, and all invited. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.